Well, uh, welcome to Moss Stories. Uh, now we've got Tim Purchase, who's an amazing moss man or bryologist, um, to give us a summary of some of the mosses that you might find from pavement outside your door to up on top of Dartmoor, on top of the moors, where, you know, mosses grow everywhere. And we're encouraging people to just have a little bit of a look wherever they live and start to appreciate them. So I'll hand over to Tim now and look forward to hearing your um, presentation, Tim. Okay, let me just get my screen share going. Okay, over the next 10 minutes, I'm going to take you for take you on a journey from the streets of Plymouth up onto Dartmoor. And on the way, we're gonna stop at several of the habitats that we find on, 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 on a, uh, such a journey. And in each one, I want to tell you a short story about it based around some of the species of moss that we find there. Now, the first habitat is our towns and, and, and our uh, cities. Um, so our pavements and our walls and our gardens, um, places like that that are very close to us, we're very familiar with. And the story I want to tell you here is a story about mosses as pioneers, how they've adapted to what is quite a new environment for them. Here's the first species, common pocket moss. This is a, it's a pioneer of bare ground. So if you've got a garden and you dig over the soil and then leave it for a while, perhaps over winter, when you come back after a while, you will see these quite dense clumps of small fern-like shoots, which is common pocket moss. Although they look quite like a fern, obviously they're much, much smaller. So they're probably between one and two centimeters long. Um, they're about, a dozen, perhaps a few more similar species that, that, that occur in this country, but it is by far and away the most common one that you will see in our gardens. And it also occurs out quite commonly out the countryside as well. But again, it relies on bare ground. So often it occurs where there's been human disturbance. The second moss is wall screw moss. And as its name suggests, this is a species that you'll find growing on wall tops. Out in, out in the wild, it's a species you would find growing on limestone, perhaps. Uh, but concrete and cement, which are made from limestone, are a very suitable alternative for it. And in fact, certainly in this part of the world, I see it growing far more commonly in our towns and cities than I do out in the broader countryside. And what makes this one stand out is the great mass of capsules that it throws up. Um, and each of those capsules is on the end of a stalk. Now, these capsules are what produces the spores, the tiny balls of cells that blow away in the wind and enable the, um, enable the moss to establish uh, a new home elsewhere. What's also worth noticing about this particular species of moss is that the leaves end in a long white hair, and that's an adaptation to allow it to hold on to water and to attract water, because growing in such a dry habitat, it's really important to it. That it makes the most of whatever water it could find. On the next habitat now, which is lowland woodland, the sort of woodland you find out in the countryside, but also you'll find this sort of woodland um, in urban areas as well. This picture and a couple of the pictures on the next two slides were taken not far from me, right in the middle of Plymouth. The story I want to tell you here is a story about air pollution and an environmental success story. Some of you who are old enough may remember back in the 80s, um, there was a lot of concern about acid rain and the sort of problems it was causing. And acid rain was a big problem for mosses that grow on trees. It did them a lot of damage and they were driven out a lot of their range. They were only really able to exist in areas where air pollution was, was much lower. But since we've tackled acid rain, there's much less acid rain now. These species of moss and liverwort have been able to recolonize the areas where they used to live. And that recolonization is still going on, but they're certainly far more common now. And here's our first species, lateral crefaya. The picture on the left shows a vertical tree trunk hidden behind those branches that this species throws out. Very much a species you'll find growing on trees. And it does put out this great mass of branches. And on the branches, you will see capsules again, these are capsules like you get on the wall screw moss, but they're on a very short stalk. 
and that gives this particular species of moss a very distinctive look. It's quite easy to spot, and it's also very common, quite an easy one for you to find if you go out in our lowland woodlands in cities and out in the countryside. Our next species is our first species of liverwort. This is forked veilwort. Liverworts are another very ancient group of plants. They first appeared about 400 million years ago. They're usually grouped together with mosses. That's where the term bryophytes comes from. Bryophytes is a term that covers both mosses and liverworts. And in this case, this species of liverwort doesn't even have leaves. It just has these green strips of tissue, which are quite tiny, about a millimeter or so wide. But it's quite easy to pick out on trees you're walking past because it forms these roughly round green patches. And again, it's another species very common in our cities and also outside. In the country in the broader countryside. So now our journey has taken us to the edge of the moorlands, um, the, the river valleys around Dartmoor and also around Exmoor. This is where we find temperate rainforest. The story here is about how we can use species of liverwort and moss as indicators of the sort of habitat we're in and the quality of the habitat. A few years ago I was involved with a project with plant life. Plant Life is the national charity that fights to preserve our native flora. And they were trying to find additional temperate rainforest sites and assess how good they were. And I was involved in helping train up volunteers to recognize certain species of moss and liverwort that were a particularly good indicators of high quality rainforest. And these volunteers then went out and surveyed potential, potential rainforest sites to see just how good they are. And I picked two species of liverwort this time because they were they are just such colorful species. And the first of them is tamarisk scalewort. This has got a lowland relative, but that lowland relative um, grows very closely pressed up against tree bark. Tamarisk scalewort forms these wonderful bushy clumps on trees, really makes it stand out. And it can be quite common in good quality habitat it needs really high, high humidity habitat. From the inset picture, you can see that it does actually have leaves. So this one's a leafy liverwort, but those leaves are really very closely pressed up against each other and pressed up against the, 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 the stalks of the shoots. Now we come to rustwort, another really wonderfully colorful species of liverwort. And you can really appreciate the color from that picture on the right. What you don't see so clearly in the picture on the right is the scale of it. And this is absolutely tiny, those shoots and leaves are minute. But what it lacks in size, it can make up for in abundance when it finds the right habitat. Uh, this is a species that grows on, on uh, rotting wood. So it first of all needs high humidity and it also needs plenty of rotting wood so it can find wood in the right habitat. So it's a really good indicator not only of high humidity, but also really well-managed woodland, woodland where the dead wood is being left to rot down and it's a home, of course, for all sorts of other species. So we're gonna finish up now the end of our journey up on Dartmoor. Dartmoor is of course fantastic habitat for bryophytes. I could speak easily for an entire hour just on them, but the story I'm gonna focus on here is on sphagnum moss which is what the rest of the evening is going to be, uh, uh, the rest of the evening is going to be talking about. So sphagnum mosses, the story about them is the ecosystem services they provide. They store carbon for us and they hold on to the water as it falls on to the moors. We have about 38 species of sphagnum moss in this country and about half of them occur in Devon. And this picture on the left shows actually shows three of them. There's the red moss here, quite a clear one, the pale shoots of a second species, and also hidden away is the paler brown shoots of quite a chunky moss. Now, of those species we get in Devon, two of them are really important for storing carbon for, for, for forming peat. And those two species are two of the ones in this image, the red one and the less obvious chunky brown one. On the right, there's a shoot of sphagnum, Sphagnum mosses, again, a very distinctive group of mosses. None of the other mosses look at all like this. And you can see at the top of the shoot is a growing point where the branches and the stem grow from. 
and then the stem elongates downwards and you can see the branches much more clearly then and that disappears down into the bog where eventually it will dry and where eventually it will die and store away carbon for us. And here's a closer picture of those two really important um, peat forming mosses. One is red bog moss, very obvious one. If you go out onto a good piece of bog, you'll find quite large patches of this wonderful wine red colored sphagnum moss. And the other one is not quite such an obvious one, but it's quite a big chunky one with this lovely pale brown color. So there we are, that's our journey from Plymouth up onto Dartmoor Complete. And I'm now hand you back over to Naomi. Thank you, Tim. That was uh, that was brilliant. What a what a lovely journey from outside your front door up on top of the moors. I, I especially like the colours. You know, a lot of people, a lot of people think that all mosses are just green, but they're not, are they? They are. Yeah, there are some mosses and, and, and liverworts that have a one a wonder, really wonderful colour. Yeah. And and really nice to hear the stories of how mosses help our environment. You know, they're they're sequestering carbon and they're reducing flooding and as well as purifying the air and doing their normal capturing sun's energy photosynthesis as plants. So thank you very much. And hopefully we'll see each other again on another Zoom. And also there is a walk. Um as part of the crowdfunder, which we're talking about at the end of this um, show. So see you see you soon, Tim. Thank you. Okay, right, we do. Thank you. Have we got any questions about mosses? Not yet. Everybody carry on um, using the chat if you if you would like to, and we can bring up questions and talk about it as we go. Um, the second person, thanks, Tim, and we'll move on now. And we have Martin Gillard from the Dartmoor National Park uh, as an archaeologist as part of the South West Peatland Partnership as well. And he um, has so many more stories to tell about the history that's held within the peat but and on the moor. So I'll hand over to to Martin and we look forward to hearing more Martin. We've heard Tim talking about the moss, we've seen lots of images of that moss um, as it's growing and I suppose a lot of my work is uh, uh, involved with the peat, uh, the peat which is what the moss becomes after it's stopped growing um, and uh, Oh, let's see. Now, can I get my slides to move on? There we go. Um, but the other thing, of course, I'm going to talk about, talking about Dartmoor. Um, I've got 10 minutes to cover about 10,000 years of the great range of human activity. Um, we have an aerial shot here of prehistoric fields and settlements, um, uh, probably dating from the Bronze Age and the preservation and the extent of these on Dartmoor is something uh, uh, on a sort of international scale of importance. Um, and the other sort of um, archaeology of Dartmoor um, on a similar sort of scale and uh, significance is the, um, the history of extracting tin from Dartmoor as well. There's a shot here of some uh, waste heaps left behind by tin streaming that's been going on for thousands of years um and uh again so something that's uh like those bronze age landscapes those extensive landscapes this is also something that's very rare to find elsewhere mainly for geological reasons the obvious uh, other places on the uh the granite uplands of uh of cornwall um, and i'll be talking about them a bit as well but um Huge amounts of Dartmoor is covered under a thick layer of peat. And uh, here's an example of it actually, um, <clears throat> not actually that thick, really. That uh, scale in the middle is about one metre. So we're looking about a metre and a half, two metres there. There are deposits of peat, sometimes much thicker, four or five metres in places. And they're created, this isn't simply soil as you and I would find in our garden. But they're created when those mosses, those sphagnums and other plants, when they die in very um, 
in wet uh, and often cold conditions. They don't rot away like uh, other things do, uh, like things would do, say, in our garden, but they are preserved uh, by those conditions. And that's why store of carbon, because they're an organic material that sucks that carbon out of the atmosphere, but because it hasn't rotted away, it's uh, preserved. But unfortunately, in places like this, where you can see it's eroding, then that will be releasing the carbon again. Um, which is why we're we've got peatland restoration projects. But anyway, that's not not something for me to to talk about at this time. But these layers of peat um, often developed in the Bronze Age and later, three thousand years ago, and they actually covered over in some cases the remains of past human activity. There's uh, this image here. Can we see that line? There's obviously a road there. That's the road from a uh, Prince Town down to uh, Tavistock, but also this road running, this line running parallel to it is uh, the Warhampton Reeve. A reeve is a prehistoric boundary dating back to the Bronze Age, 3,000 years ago, something like that. And uh, particularly on the Southern Moor, there's great lengths of these and field systems associated with them. I could wax lyrical for an hour or so about them, but obviously I'm not going to now. But a point I'm making here, can we see sort of up at the top right here, the reeve almost disappears. And it's because partly because it's eroding, but partly because it's been covered by peat. A lot of this peat has developed after this peak of human activity on the moor. So things are often hidden beneath it. This stone here, um, is it a standing stone? Well, it's a stone that's standing, isn't it? Um, uh, and if it is uh, a standing stone, our ancestors in the uh, Bronze Age, maybe the late Neolithic period, the late uh, Stone Age, three to 4,000 years, stood these stones up. Um, I can't begin starting to uh, discuss why this might, this might be uh, in this time, but... Uh, this feature I found it wasn't previously recorded, um, and it actually sits in a Victorian peat cutting because, of course, people also use peat as a fuel because it's organic material, it can be dried out and burnt. So, it's an example where you have this older human activity covered over by the peat and then revealed again by later disturbance. And there's a sort of shot of it looking a bit lonely there. On, uh, on the slopes of Amacum Hill, Amacum Hill on the northwest of Dartmoor. The, the scale that's always in my photographs is, is a metre long to give you an, an idea of size. Um, and there are other examples of this. Uh, Stone Row at um, Cut Hill, Stone Circle at Sitterford. These are examples of prehistoric monuments which have been covered over uh, by the later development of peat. Um, and another sort of feature, um, another um, structure, if you like, this was the kist. A kist is a stone box used in prehistory for a burial or a, uh, uh, a cremation to be stored in, uh, to be put in. And this was on Whitehorse Hill on the uh, northern moor, found in the noughties, um, eroding out of the peat there. And it's the only example of a kist which has been um, sort of excavated with modern techniques. And it, um, it shows superbly the quality of peat for preserving organic materials. This is a wickerwork basket that was found in there. It's about 3000 years old, preserved in that peat for all that time. Um, another example, these uh, wooden artefacts. We're not quite sure what they are. Are they buttons? Are they toggles? Are they even uh, spacers for flesh piercings to sort of put, put in your ears or something like that? We don't know. But they're, uh, they're spindle wood and looking close at them, we can tell they've been turned to make them spun around. Um, they're the oldest examples of wood turning found in Northern Europe, preserved in that peat of Dartmoor. 
And another fantastic object that was found there. These are beads made of tin. I'm sure they would have been much brighter at the time. And this bracelet is made of nettle fibre, surviving three, three and a half thousand years. Take yourself down to the box, Plymouth Museum. You can see these artefacts or at the uh, visitor centre at Postbridge. You've got replicas of them as well. But going in on a smaller scale again, um, Pete is excellent at preserving these things. And here we have examples of pollen that's preserved in, in peat. And uh, of course, if we can tell the mixtures of pollen that are, that are there, we can tell us something about the environment that was there in the past. And why have I got this picture here of a pile of a, of a cow pat? These fungi will only grow on cow pats and their spores, again, are preserved in the peat. And from the varying levels of those spores, we can basically tell how many animals were on the moor, how big a herds of cattle or sheep people were keeping there. So it's this record of our, our, um, our, our relationship with our landscape, with Dartmoor. And it being in that column of peat, because peat is organic, we can date it, carbon-14 dating. There's not time to explain how it works, but we can tell how old those layers of peat are so we can see those changes in our landscape. We can take samples out of them. This is a sample being taken. I must admit this one was being uh, bored out on Bodmin Moor on the uh, north side of a place called um, Pritikham Down, a couple miles from Jamaica Inn. Uh, the peat is being taken out. It's about three metres deep. And uh, you, can, you can look at all those pollens and things I was talking about and get an idea of the landscape. I can't talk in detail about it, but basically the... Uh, uh, the dark green indicates trees, the pink is uh, dwarf shrubs, the green is grasses. We can see how that landscape changes. But here's an another little thing. Um, how am I doing for time? I'm all right, aren't I? Look at the You've date. Got another, got another minute or so. That, oh, how exciting. Uh, look yeah, at the I'm date that we've got here. That is 10,700 years ago. That column of peat, the very earliest parts of it, dated back about 12,000 years to the end of the last ice age, an unbroken record of that environment and how we as humans were interacting with it. And uh, this came out of the peat down near the bottom of that sequence, twigs, bits of leaf. We can see those leaves there. Those are leaves dating back thousands of years preserved in that peat. That's the potential if that peat is in good condition that we can learn that story of our environment and how we were interacting with it dating back over thousands of years. And uh, there we are. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank um, you very much. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry to say I do have to fly off. If yeah. there are questions for me, maybe you could forward them to yeah, me. Yeah, of then. course. And I, and I will do my but, best. But such a, such a lovely, yeah. I know it's a speedy taster of um, all that P Pete Morlands can hold as, as the histories of our land yeah. and landscape. So um, if, if there's any questions now, I've got a few minutes. If we're... Does anybody want to ask Martin a question? Otherwise, we'll, and they, they're all saying thank you very much. And thank you. You're welcome. Thank fantastic. you very much for inviting me. Yeah. Yeah. So thank you. So we've heard we've heard the story of all the different species growing from the pavement up to the moor. Then we've we've heard some of that uh, real long history. You know, there's only a millimetre of of sphagnum peat growing per year. So that three metres is and more is 12,000 years of of. Um, history held so that's what we've done so far the next speaker scott davidson is has been analyzing the peat and the the role of the mosses for a few years i mean he's doing all sorts of interesting research but i'm gonna hand over to him and he can explain his story of uh what the peat and the mosses are telling us Hello, everyone. Can you see my screen okay? 
Yes, we can. Perfect. Hi, so yeah, thank you very much, Naomi, and everyone for inviting me today to speak about one of my favorite topics in the world, um, peatlands and sphagnum moss. And so today I'm going to present, yeah, the wonders of sphagnum moss, as it's going to be alluded to so far tonight, and why they're so good at storing carbon and what makes peatlands so important. And at the end, I'll touch on a kind of cool citizen science project that has a slightly arty theme to it that might be of interest to the people in the room, well, the virtual room. Um, <clears throat> So to start off with just a very brief introduction to who I am, I'm uh, Dr. Scott Davidson, I'm a lecturer in ecosystem resilience at the University of Plymouth. I lead the uh, Wetland Resilience Research Group. Um, actually, one of, my, uh, one of my PhD students is in the room, Emma, which is uh, nice to see. Um, and so my research is focused on kind of my elevator pitch is the response, the recovery and the resilience of peatland ecosystems to change globally. And so I'm very, very fortunate that I get to work in some fantastic, beautiful peatlands across the Northern Hemisphere, across Canada, Alaska and Northern Europe. And now that I'm back in the UK, um, I'm from the, I'm from Scotland originally, but sometimes my accent tries to tell otherwise. Um, uh, yeah, I, I'm working on some local peatlands as well here in the southwest, but very, very lucky to work in some beautiful, beautiful landscapes. And so to start off with, as we know, um, and we've probably heard quite a lot in the media recently, peatlands are incredibly important, but historically they have been under underappreciated and overutilized. And so we've thought of them historically as a wasteland. Um, areas that we can just drain readily, but we're beginning to get to the point where we realize how just how important these ecosystems are. And so peatlands are one of the largest natural terrestrial carbon stores in the world. They don't get shouted out about as much as rainforests or other kinds of ecosystems, but they're incredibly important. And they store around 550 billion tons of carbon in their soil. And this is around 21% of all the global soil organic carbon stock which basically equates to storing more carbon than all other vegetation types in the world combined. So they're incredibly important ecosystems. Um, and they are what we call as an, a nature-based solution to climate change. That is harnessing the power of nature to help us fight climate change. And peatlands are probably one of the best players in that, in that battle. So why do peatlands store so much carbon relative to other ecosystems? I'm gonna take you back hopefully maybe to some high school biology, but if you look at this diagram here, we've got an ecosystem with some plants and some soil. And the, eco the carbon stored in a typical ecosystem is a balance between the input through photosynthesis, um, through plants or mosses, and the decomposition from microbes. But what makes peatlands unique is that they are saturated or they're waterlogged. And so there's a lot of water in them. They're, they're, they're wetlands, they're a type of wetland. And so this means that that soil will lack oxygen and that can really slow down that rate of plant decomposition. So you see there, the arrow gets smaller, those waterlogged conditions hold on to that carbon. And so normally plants will lose their leaves and they'll decompose and they'll release carbon back to the atmosphere. And the balance between what's coming in and what's coming out helps us understand how much carbon these ecosystems are storing. But these waterlogged conditions means that over tens of thousands of years, dead plants accumulate, uh, build up on top of each other to form peat, as shown in this photo here. So this is a peat core. Um, and this allows them to store carbon for long, long periods of time. And we think of it as that the, the input is greater than the output. And so these sites are a carbon sore or a carbon sink. So they're holding on to their carbon rather than releasing it like a typical other kind of ecosystem, such as a woodland or a grassland. So sphagnum is one of the best ways to uh, make peat. It's one of the best species to form peat. I will say that nearly every kind of vegetation in the right conditions can make peat, um, but sphagnum is one of the best ones. They're incredibly important mosses. One of, I think one of the most important organisms in the world. Um, I often tell my students that we should focus on sphagnum and not pandas when it comes to what we save in the world because they're incredibly important. And to be honest, not only are they important, but they're damn beautiful. I spent a lot of my time taking photographs of mosses, um, especially sphagnum. And so sphagnum moss has some impressive and maybe kind of unsuspecting characteristics. It can hold uh, 20 times its own weight in water. It keeps the ground wet throughout the year. It holds that water at the soil surface. And so it makes it a foundational species of many peatland habitats. I kind of think of it as 
um, sphagnum growing and mats across the ground. It's very acidic and the sphagnum moss mosses grow year on year and it compresses it down into the water table and so traps that carbon in there. It doesn't let those that vegetation decompose as you might find in another kind of ecosystem. And so again, I kind of explained to my students that I think of sphagnum growing on the bodies of its dead brothers and sisters because it just pushes everything down and keeps on going. Um, and that lends sphagnum moss its greatest and most useful characteristic, I think, um, with the formation of peat, as mentioned previously by Martin. And so, like I said, peat is formed by layers upon layers of sphagnum moss growing over thousands of years. And so roughly one meter of moss might uh, equate to a thousand years of stored carbon and plant matter. And sadly, in Dartmoor, a lot of the peatlands are disturbed, but there's a lot of fantastic work happening in the Southwest, especially by the Southwest Peatland Partnership on trying to restore these ecosystems. And we're not very fortunate in the UK to have many areas that are intact still, but there are places up in north of Scotland in the flow country, which is the largest expanse of blanket bog in Europe and potentially the world, which have peat reaching up to 10 metres. So it just shows the scale of how long those peatlands have been, been on the landscape. They're incredibly important ecosystems. And so it's kind of like that was just a little whistle stop tour into why sphagnum is so important. It's an incredible species. And like I said, I think we should care more about sphagnum and less about some of these more charismatic megafauna and it's the it's the small scale that actually really impacts the big scale so i'm going to uh, link into this kind of idea as you saw from my photographs previously sphagnum are incredibly beautiful colors and they come in a variety of colors and that kind of gave me the idea for this uh, project i'm going to explain now which is looking at how peatlands change color over time and so given this is a community of people interested in art um, I thought I'd highlight this creative community science project that I created a few years ago. So a little bit of background just to get you up to speed. I'm looking at phenology with this and phenology is basically a word used to describe the development of how a plant changes over the course of its life history. This could be when it flowers, when the buds break, when it fruits, or in my case, the greening up and then the browning of vegetation over time. And we know from a scientific point of view, the phenology of leaf traits, so the greenness, when it becomes greenest and when it starts to turn brown, are really important drivers of that carbon cycle that I mentioned previously, how that carbon is stored within the productive, they're potentially going to be greenest and they'll be storing more carbon. And so I thought to myself, if I could harness the power of the smartphone in everyone's pocket, to try and understand how we change, uh, monitor and track the colors of uh, peatlands. It's a non-descriptive destructive method. I, all I need is a photograph and I can analyze those photographs to look at the greenness. This is basically just taking the red, green, blue information in the photograph and calculating an index. And it allows me within, on my, with my scientific heart on, my research hat on, linking it potentially to how much carbon is being stored by these ecosystems based on some other research that I've done. And so not only is this a really neat scientific project, but it's also an incredibly visual project. And I've got some photographs coming up showing you just how dynamic these ecosystems are. I think historically peatlands and wetlands have been thought of as quite boring compared to other ecosystems, but they change a lot over the course of the year. And so I started this project in Canada when I lived there. I, I lived in Canada for three years before coming to Plymouth. And I started a project on a publicly accessible peatland in Alberta and um, near Grand Prairie with Ducks Unlimited Canada. And so Ducks Unlimited is kind of our version of the wild, uh, their version of the Wildfowl Wetlands Trust, and um, the biggest conservation group in Canada, focused specifically on saving their wetlands. And we worked together, they gave me some funding to set up a, a cradle for a phone. You might have seen similar around here, um, looking at Coast Snap, for example. Um, but how we can uh, take photographs to, to track the change in peatlands over time. And so this project's been running for three years now, and you can see for, this is just a snapshot of the photographs. I have hundreds of photographs come through, but you can see the beautiful color change in colors in these peatlands and wetlands over time. And so it's a fixed point location. Someone comes along, slides their smartphone into the cradle. It takes the same uh, photograph each time from the same angle, the same distance, and people send them to me and I can analyze them for their greenness and other types of uh, information from them as well. And not only do people send me their photographs, but what's really nice and what, what I didn't anticipate from this project is when people are taking the photographs and they email me, 
they often provide a little snapshot of their day. They tell me why they're on the peatland, what they thought of the peatland, why they, why they think it matters and how excited they are to be part of a scientific project, so which is a really, really neat thing as well. And so we see here, we've got 2021, 2022, and then this year. And you might notice, keen eyes amongst you, there's a little bit of haze in the photographs. As you've seen from the media, Canada has been on fire this year. <laughs> And so we've been impacted slightly by wildfire, but there is a big difference. So if you see, this is some data, I don't wanna uh, bamboozle you with too much data, but we can see over time, we've got the three years here and we see there is a difference in the greenness over time. And so there's some caveats involved, obviously it's different, photo, uh, different types of phones, um, different times of day, but what's really neat is we can use that color to showcase how these peatlands change over time. And so I've expanded this project recently, um, we've got, uh, the Sustainable Earth Institute at the University of Plymouth, which I know the Arts and Energy Collective are involved with, they gave me some funding to upscale this project to take it global. And so we've got cradles set up in Scotland and Cornwall at the Eden Project currently. And then in the future, over winter this year, we're going to set them up in Finland, Sweden, Canada, um, Germany, France, Ecuador. So to get people involved in really seeing how fantastic these peatlands are and the change in colour. And so... Um, the one of the best ones we've got set up so far is the one in the slow country. So as I mentioned earlier, these areas are fantastic areas of blanket bog off in the very north of Scotland, beautiful landscape. And so we've got a frame set up there. We set it up in June. And since then, we've had over 150 photographs of the peatland over time. And this is, again, it's just a snapshot. And so it's a really, really neat project. I, one, of the, one of the best things about it is, like I said, getting those emails from people telling me about their day. Why were they on the peatland? What did they enjoy about the peatland? Uh, which is really, really neat. And so that's me. Hopefully I didn't go over time. But if anybody has any questions, I'm more than happy to answer them. Well, we, I thank you very much, Scott. And, and uh... Um, such an interesting example of getting getting passers by and communities involved in just engaging and connecting with uh, the peatlands. Uh, yeah, really it's really it's really difficult with uh, carbon, especially because it's it's mm. an invisible gas. It's invisible; they don't know what it is. And so, if you can try and link it to something visual, I think it's very very uh, very effective way yeah. of getting people to care. I agree with you. And uh, art, the Art and Energy Collective has been uh, working up on Dartmoor with communities doing our very small scale acts of restoration. But in that process, um, which has involved quite a lot of creativity and making, uh, we have been working with somebody called Angelique McBride, who's part of the Dartmoor Headwaters Project. And um, Angelique, I was just sort of wondering, really, how have you been um, going about that sort of restoration work in your project, the Headwaters Project? Well, well tell us what, what it is, basically, but then how, how have you been going about it? Yeah, sure. Um, I did have a question for Scott, actually. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> do ask any questions. Um, yes. So the, the tracking of the colours, has it been on... Um, restored peat or has it just been on peat, uh, peatlands in general so at the moment uh just peat, just intact peatlands because i have to rely on them being publicly accessible to make sure there's enough foot traffic um i have mm -hmm. a project with um my collaborators in canada where we're working with the and it's quite contentious here in the uk the idea of this but working with the canadian sphagnum peat association to who harvests sphagnum sustainably um but part of their sustainability is to restore they restore their their peat bogs really successfully and um and so we're setting up some frames on the restored sites because they have actually some quite nicely accessible peatlands over mm -hmm. there and so i'd be very keen in the future to kind of set up frames at restored sites that have enough foot traffic or if there's one or two keen people who are going there regularly enough they want to be part of it um actually a lot of, a lot of the times the canadian one over the last few years um this year, because of the fires, uh, a lot of the photographs were just taken by one man and his dog, and he was very keen to <laughs> send in photographs regularly. Because that would be very fast, like a really easy citizen science for us in terms of uh, what we've restored and then have people take photos. I've had this idea 
about how we track the change and yeah. that might be a way for you, you know we can send the data to you and you could see you could track the changes of the color yeah i have a i have a box on my desk of uh tens of phone cradles so i'm more than happy to get people involved if they've got uh if they're yeah. interested so yeah i should i'll um maybe pop your email address somewhere and i will i'll be in touch brilliant Fantastic. Yeah. So, Angelique, um, what what are you doing on the moors then? Yeah. Okay. So, um, I'll give a bit of an introduction about who I am and uh, the project I'm working on. So, mm. um, I'm a natural flood management officer working for Dartmoor National Park um, on our Dartmoor Headwaters project. So the Headwaters project uh, works in a few priority catchments around Dartmoor, mainly focused on those um, areas at risk of flooding. So ultimately, we're really focused on downstream flood risk and how we can mitigate against that. Um, and we use NFM, so natural flood management, um, to try and bring the into our landscape to reduce flood management is um, a way of sort of restoring natural processes um, and also emulating those natural processes um, in the landscape. So it, it'll be things like um, restoring uh, floodplains, so connecting rivers to their floodplains so that they can flood out and store water on their floodplains instead of just shooting down towards someone's garden and house, unfortunately. Um, and it'll also be things like woodland creation, um, uh, wetland creation, um, and also what we're talking about today, peatland restoration. So really up in, in those headwaters. Um, so yeah, that's that's kind of the project and what natural flood management is all about. Mm, and, uh, and... Oh, you've just gone on mute. Um, the the diagram Scott showed us of of the creation of peat showed that that sort of um, the decomposition, the carbon being lost through some decomposition, being really slowed down by the ground being wet. And I'm presuming then your main purpose up in the moors to protect that peatland. To get it wet again. Yeah, so um, Martin kind of touched on the historical um, background to Dartmoor. And unfortunately, it is that history on Dartmoor is why we're seeing the degradation in our peatlands. So um, we saw the, the pictures of the tin streaming, um, you know, those series of spoil heaps that we saw in a row. Um, so tin streaming um, was very extensive across Dartmoor. Pretty much every single river on Dartmoor has been tin streamed. Uh, and that process completely changes the topography and just the the way the river works. Yeah. Really done. It's kind of like pulling the plug um, on on our peatlands, where it's just changed the slope ever so slightly, where water runs off quicker. So we're not holding water better in our peatlands because it's just rushing off. Um, and then we what we also have. Um, which I don't think Martin mentioned was um, peat cuttings um, on our deep peat. So this would have been done um, historically to um, use as fuel. So they would have drained the peat, um, made it less wet and then extracted it and then use those peat blocks to um, for household fires, but also industry. So for also... Um, those tin mills would have needed energy, so they would have used the peat to keep those tin mills going. Um, so what's happened with those peat cuttings is we've lost all that peat, but they also go straight down the slope. So water, again, just rushes off. And then when water picks up speed, it picks up, it picks up erosive power. So it's eroding all that peat and all that carbon straight into our rivers, exposing the peat also to um, atmosphere. So Currently on Dartmoor, a lot of our peat should be storing carbon, but is actually emitting quite a lot of our carbon, which is, which is a shame. So this is where we come in to try and 
restore that hydrology. So rain and what we do is that that water level is currently a lot lower than it should be. So we'll put in peat buns, um, timber blocks, um, and even trialing some of those wall logs. That the this is all the work that Southwest Peatland Partnership have been doing. So they're the absolute experts in this. But they would be using all those things to to raise that water level to that diagram that Scott showed um, to keep that peat wet, so that sphagnum can start um, building building carbon and building peat. Yeah, and when and when all those buns are placed across the the streams and the overflows from the top of the moor, and the water level rises, then once you've got that level, the sphagnum can I'm going to call rewild. I'm going to call uh, <laughs> renaturalize those mm. those areas and start creating peat again. Is that, is that yeah what exactly? So so basically, what we're trying to do is we're trying to tip the balance for sphagnum to grow. So we're just currently we we've got a degradated degradation of peat and sphagnum really struggle in those sorts of environments because it's not wet enough. If we can just tip the balance into a wetter environment, then we can just leave it all up to the sphagnum and then they do all the work for us. They start storing carbon, they start holding the water, like Scott says, that they hold 20 times their weight in water. That acts as like an amazing sponge for us to not only like hold the water when it rains so it doesn't end up in people's homes, mm -hmm but also as a drought resilience because it releases the water slowly back into our rivers. So um, they're brilliant, brilliant for flood risks and brilliant for drought. They'll start sequestering the carbon for us. Um, another big issue, um, which is why Southwest Water are quite interested in restoring our peatlands. Um, so they're one of the leading peat increases acidification to our rivers, which is really detrimental to our fish populations. Um, and also, whenever you walk across Dartmoor and you see the, our rivers, they're quite brown. That That is from our peat, that is from eroding peat, um, and that is dissolved organic carbon. And that um, ends up in our reservoirs, and that ends up as drinking, drinking water supply. So Southwest Water spend a lot of money to remove that color because I think we'd all get a fright if we turn our taps on and it just this brown stuff comes out. So they spend a lot of money to try and remove that. So instead of spending it on chemicals, why not restore the peatlands so less of it ends up into our in, in our waters? So there's just so many reasons for doing yeah. what you're doing, Angelique. How lovely to have a job that is <laughs> has all that potential of solving a real problem. The, the flooding, the acidification, the degradation, the, yeah, just restoring um, our beautiful moorlands into, mm. into a really healthy ecosystem. And all, well, I know it's not 100% down to the moss, but because our whole being at the moment is about mosses, it's all down to sphagnum and other small plants. Mm -hmm. um, absolutely in our peatlands but yeah mosses also play a role in our temperate rainforests as well so mustn't forget about them no we don't and tim showed us some of those so thanks very much angelique because we are now going to whiz over to chloe my colleague chloe and because i have omitted to tell everybody also that we uh our next um mass participation artwork is going to be a well it is a mossy carpet and chloe is going to tell us a bit about that and our latest trying to raise resources to make it 50 meters long but i'll hand hand over to her hi so we're really excited and slightly terrified and not quite sure why we're doing this because we swore we would never do this again. But after our last project, Moths to a Flame, where we had 58,000 people involved in looking at moth, moths, not moths, moths, uh, for inspiration, we've been trying to find a project that would speak to the powers within and help us all find a way to respond to the climate emergency. 
and over the past two years with people like Angelique, with our partners on Dartmoor, uh, we've been developing the Mossy Carpet, which is currently um, in its smaller version on display at the Theatre Royal in Plymouth. So if anyone would like to go and have a see it, of what it looks like at the beginning, then please do. I'm going to show you now our crowdfunder video for the Mossy Carpet, which will help us to grow the carpet. And this is our crowdfunder platform, which we'll share in the chat. And it tells you we're trying to raise £30,000. We've got 20, uh, we've got 35 days left in order to try and do that. Um, and, and everyone is very welcome to come and have a look at uh, this uh, crowdfunder site. And here is hopefully this is work, the video um, for the project. <music> Hello, we're from the Art and Energy Collective, an award-winning group of artists who design mass participation artworks in response to the climate emergency. We're asking for help to make our ambitious new artwork, The Mossy Carpet. Through this crowdfunder, we hope to raise over £30,000 to allow us to work with thousands of people in and around Plymouth to make 50 metres of The Mossy Carpet for a celebration of local climate actions in 2024 the climate and ecological emergency is the giant of our times, but we know that many people are making brilliant changes in their lives and communities mm -hmm. to take steps towards a brighter, greener future. The Mossy Carpet celebrates this to give us hope and new ideas for what we could do in our own lives. Now lately, we've been working with communities on Dartmoor to restore parts of the carbon-rich peatland. And we've been inspired by how tiny mosses nurture all of life. We've developed this artwork to highlight how many tiny actions can together be beautiful and make a big difference. So here's how you can help. You can make a small donation to help support mossy carpet workshops and to make it possible for us to take the carpet to festivals and events. You could fund an entire Mossy Carpet workshop for a school or a community group, or you could nab yourself one of our limited edition tardigrades. These donations will be tripled by Aviva Save Our Wild Isles Fund. So if you donate just the price of a cup of coffee, the project will receive a tenner. The Mossy Carpet already looks awesome and people ask us what we plan to do with it. So far, it's 12 metres long and has been made by 5,000 people. But your donations will help us continue this creativity and have conversations about climate with thousands more people, culminating in an event in the summer to celebrate local climate action. You could nominate someone who's done something really special to take a walk of fame along this carpet <laughs> at that special event. And of course, you can also get involved creatively too by making a pom-pom or recording a message to add to the carpet. Have a look at our website for more information. Thank you so much for watching this film and please share it with your friends or family or your communities. We hope you've been inspired to support the Mossy Carpet and to use art to celebrate everyone's steps towards a brighter, greener future. There we go. Now, um, I really hope that there's something in there in our, um, in, uh, our set of rewards that might tempt you to support the project. There's all sorts of things like um, supporting a school or a community group to have a day long workshop, or you can get yourself a tardigrade or you can, um, come along to one of our events and I know that um, I know that we'll be going on a mossy walk at some point which will be really fun yeah, there's, um, well, the, the mossy walk is in February led by Tim and it'll be around Plymouth and showing us some of those mosses that he showed us earlier by the way I do promise I have changed since making that video I know I'm wearing the same jumper <laughs> I definitely have done other things as well since making the video. Yeah. The, the, what we find, Chloe, with the mossy carpet is that there's so many different ways of um, 
joining in with it, isn't it? So you can be completely hooked on mosses, can't you? And be inspired yeah. by them and notice them and create pieces for the mossy carpet that reflect those mosses that you've got interested in, whether they're pom-pom sphagnum mosses or whether they're the little um, screw moss on the on the walls. Absolutely, but, you're right. Um, and, and the thing is that, you know, what we're all talking about essentially is a response to the climate and ecological emergencies. And um, um, we've talked about this huge value of tiny, unnoticed mosses. And um, when, and I think lots of people can be quite overwhelmed by the enormity of the challenge. But when we go small and think about mosses and we start thinking about all of the tiny actions that we can all take, all the different sorts of things that we can all do, I think it is, I think it is, it can be really exciting and it can be really hopeful to be reminded that each and every person in this room is doing something. And by by focusing on what we're doing and the positive and the hope, and hopefully we can all encourage everyone else to join in too. Yeah, exactly. I thought I thought I could just give a quick recommendation. Um, I've got this book, Gathering Mosses, mm. by Robin Wall Tamara. It's brilliant. It is so good, and it goes through all the different mosses, and then sort of like um at the end a kind of tells a story about what that moss, moss is or, or how she's come about studying it. Um, so I highly recommend it. And there's a lovely bit in there about sphagnum mosses and how much of a superhero they are. Yeah, there is. So she, she manages to um, trans, translate the stories and science of mosses into the, the human behaviors and and our role in in living with those mosses at as an equal species doesn't she it's really um a very good book indeed so um i think that we've now come to the end of our uh show this evening where we have uh had a close look at mosses from your outside your front door up on top of the moors such a wide range of bryophytes to get into um with, and with tim purchase and we i'm sure we'll invite him back if he'll come and we'll um have the presentation available on the website and then we moved into the um what do we do next we then had Martin talk about the archaeology and the history of the peat and the role of mosses in holding that peat, growing that peat, which traps the whole story of the landscape through thousands of years. We moved then in with Scott telling us a bit more about how they how the carbon sequestration happens and how how important that peat is in relation directly in relation to the carbon and um, I was going to say the carbon emergency the climate emergency and then finally we have talked to Angelique about the work such important work that she's doing as well on top of the moors holding the water levels back up so that the mosses can grow so there's no flooding but there's all those other things that I hadn't quite registered to do with the acidity and the carbon um, being washed away um, out of the moor. So all in all, it's been a, a really great hour of, of learning and being inspired. And we um, hope that you might come back on the 11th of December for more about mosses and about the uh, project that we're all involved in. And um, and also in that month, you some of you might tell your friends about the Mossy Carpet and the crowdfunder and help us extend it by 50 metres um, all through next year, well, all through the summer to the summer and hold a big celebration of the local actions that people are taking. So thank you very much and see you soon. Bye-bye.